uh, we're uh, gathering together in some ways as an echo of a conversation we started earlier this week uh, as we talked about uh, Scripture and inerrancy with our faculty panel. We pick up this, uh, this afternoon with Dr. Molly Worthen, who's written this very interesting and uh, very acclaimed book, The Apostles of Reason, uh, The Crisis of Authority in American Evangelicalism. And uh, we'll say some more about that in a moment, uh, but Dr. Worthen is in part trying to tell um, the story of how evangelicals have dealt with authority and inerrancy, especially in the post-war uh, period. Um, she's a very fine, very significant uh, young historian, and there is a, a kind of nuance to her telling of the story, our story, our tribe, if you will, uh, that she almost knows better than we know ourselves. Uh, and so it's, uh, I hope, uh, a... Um, uh, an encouragement as well as a chastening. Uh, sometimes it's important to hear our own narrative uh, uh, told uh, by somebody who's looking at sources that we sometimes don't look at and uh, often taken for granted. Dr. Worthen is assistant professor of history at UNC Chapel Hill, down in God's country, as they say, I think, in North Carolina, at least this time of year when there's no snow there and there is uh, here. Uh, she grew up outside of Chicago uh, and uh, educated both undergrad and her doctoral work at Yale. Uh, so a little bit of New England roots. We do consider on occasion Connecticut to be part of the Republic uh, up here in New England. Uh, work uh, some uh, beginnings in diplomatic history in the post-war period uh, that then took her to uh, uh, understand American culture and its religious impulses and got interested in our tribe, the evangelicals, and how we dealt with the post-war period and authority uh, in that. Um, she teaches courses uh, on evangelicals in uh, a place like uh, UNC Chapel Hill, global evangelicalism, uh, sin and evil in the modern world. You can imagine what that must be like in a large public university wrestling with those uh, questions. Uh, she has uh, been a, a kind of sympathetic observer of, uh, of the evangelical movement, and I hope you'll hear that sympathy, but also that critical uh, eye. Sometimes uh, we are not nearly as self-critical, and sometimes we are overly critical of ourselves. Uh, and uh, finding that balance, I hope, will be part of the story today. So, uh, would you welcome uh, warmly uh, 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 as um, our final uh, forum lecturer uh, this year, uh, Dr. Molly Worthen. Thank you so much for coming. I know this is a really busy time of year. I very much appreciate you taking your, your lunch hour to, to come talk with me today. To start with, you can help me out with an informal poll that I've been doing. I'm curious, when someone asks you, what kind of Christian are you, how many of you would answer evangelical? Could you raise your hand? Okay, quite a few. How many would prefer something different, something like biblical Christian or Bible-believing Christian? Okay, that's, that's interesting. This is, this is a little bit exceptional uh, to the pattern I've noticed when I've asked this question of some other uh, conservative Protestant audiences uh, where I've encountered quite a bit of resistance to my attempt to smash the label evangelical on them. Uh, I was just at Messiah College down in Pennsylvania, and the faculty I met there said that their students are generally very reluctant to use the evangelical label for themselves, really, really don't like it, find it kind of an unfamiliar fit, in part, I think, because the term has become so politicized. It seems to come with all of this baggage. Now, I am probably the first person to stand up for the evangelical label. I think it's still very useful, both to scholars and to Christians who want a tool to think about the complexity of their tradition. But if we're going to use it, it means answering at least two big questions, and that's what I'm going to try to do in the next few minutes. 
The first is, what is an evangelical, right? Uh, can we come up with an interesting working definition? And second, why is it, historically speaking, that this term has become so closely associated with a particular political and theological viewpoint? Another way of putting this would be to say, why has a relatively small number of evangelicals come to have disproportionately large cultural and political influence, come to really be the, the public face of evangelicalism? I think to understand the culture wars, to understand the so-called Christian right, we have to dig into the history of this very messy evangelical tradition. If we do that, we see that the roots of the culture wars are not just in politics. They have deeper roots in the realm of ideas, roots that I think go back at least to the 17th century. Okay, who then am I talking about when I throw around this term evangelical? Well, as I'm sure you know, some scholars have suggested a kind of checklist of key doctrines that define evangelicalism. Doctrines like the born-again experience, a high view of biblical authority, an emphasis on evangelism, and these lists are often very helpful. But the problem is that once you start digging into what exactly each of those terms mean, you find pretty quickly that evangelicals disagree on almost every detail of the born-again experience or biblical authority. So it, it gives you this illusion of certainty, I think. There is a constellation of Protestant traditions, ranging from Mennonites to Pentecostals, who sometimes can seem to disagree about, frankly, almost everything, except, I guess, you know, the divinity of Christ. But they seem to have been part of the same conversation over the centuries since the Reformation. They seem to have a stake in what one another gets up to because they orbit around the same questions. What I've concluded in my own research is that if they don't necessarily share a statement of faith, they do share a set of worries, concerns, and they are all alike and that they have had to sort out these worries in the absence of a single central authority to guide them. Because sola scriptura may sound simple enough, but we all know that it is not a very straightforward source of authority in practice. So I'm focusing on the questions rather than the answers. Three basic concerns unite the Christians that I like to corral with the term evangelical. First, how to be a disciple with a true relationship with God, or how to meet and know Jesus, to use language that some evangelicals would prefer. Second, how to repair the fracture between faith and reason. And third, how to balance personal belief against the constraints of the world, particularly the increasingly secularized public square. Now, these are all basically problems of authority. How do you obey the commands of faith, reason, community, experience, all at once? And while they're very ancient in some ways, they took on a new edge in the modern era, which I'm dating from roughly the late 17th, early 18th century, the time of the first hints of our present day division between the religious and the secular. Now, none of these worries on its own is unique to evangelicals, and I want to acknowledge that right away. But in combination, and in the absence of a magisterial arbiter capable, if not settling, then at least offering uh, guidance through uncertainties and disagreements, I do think that these concerns have shaped a distinctive spiritual community that is particularly preoccupied with the problem of intellectual authority in the modern world. Now, what does any of that have to do with politics? Well, for a long time, it has been fashionable among secular liberals to blame evangelicals' refusal to accept certain secular ideas about science and sexuality on what they often call a strain of authoritarianism in these communities. And 
liberals see this, what they mean when they say that is a kind of blind obedience to the Bible or to a pastor to the exclusion of credible secular experts. I think this diagnosis is wrong. In many evangelical communities, there is absolutely a real animosity toward the standards of secular intellectual inquiry. But the reason is the opposite of authoritarianism. The reason, in fact, is a crisis of authority, the contest between faith, reason, community, individual conscience, which all tug the believer in different directions and often command a kind of total loyalty. It is precisely because evangelicals take the authority of human reason very seriously that they are constantly trying to reconcile it with what they believe the Bible commands. Now, let me talk about the Bible for a minute. When conservative Protestants debate liberals about marriage and sexuality, when they oppose the teaching of evolution in schools, they often say that they base their beliefs on an inerrant Bible. This word, inerrancy, this has become a kind of evangelical shibboleth. Gordon Conwell's statement of faith is very typical in declaring the Bible free from error. Now, this faith in inerrancy seems at first, I think, to be a pretty simple point. Now, of course, conservative Protestants think the Bible has no mistakes in it. However, the doctrine of inerrancy is not as straightforward as it appears. And I know those of you who came to the forum earlier this week uh, started to get into this a little bit in that discussion. This is really a nut that we have to crack if we want to understand modern evangelicals and how they use the Bible in politics. The basic idea is very old. Christians have always been concerned to safeguard the Bible as a perfect source of truth. But inerrancy, as many modern evangelicals understand it, has a more recent origin. I'm going to try to summarize a complicated story quickly, and that requires us to backtrack for a few minutes to the 17th century. At this time, a couple generations after the start of the Protestant Reformation, some conservative Protestant theologians found themselves in a bind. I'm talking primarily about those in the Reformed tradition, but there were, there were some Lutherans in the mix as well. They found themselves hemmed in by intellectual challenges on both sides. On the one hand, theologians of the Catholic Counter-Reformation were busy using relentless scholastic logic to pick apart Protestant claims, while at the same time, pioneers of the scientific revolution were developing new standards of evidence, new ways of thinking about empiricist arguments, proof. And a bit later, the philosophers of the Enlightenment were busy uh, debunking the supernatural elements of Christianity, claiming that Christ's miracles could never have happened. So these embattled Protestants, caught in the middle, responded by trying to out-rationalize both the scientists and the scholastic theologians, by trying to turn their enemies' weapons back upon them, you could say. They developed a highly logical method of argument based on the techniques of both the Catholic scholastics and the Enlightenment philosophers. These ancestors of modern evangelicals took as their starting point the philosophical principle that God is perfect and unchanging. It followed logically, then, that his revelation must be perfect and unchanging, too, not just in matters pertaining to salvation, but in every scientific and historical fact, from the scope of the flood to the finest details of ancient Israel's politics. This doctrine of inerrancy matured into its most elaborate form in the mid-19th century at Princeton Theological Seminary in New Jersey. A professor there named Charles Hodge called the Bible a God-given storehouse of facts. I love that phrase, storehouse of facts. It really captures uh, this view. He said, a theologian must arrange and harmonize these facts, just as a scientist 
infers the laws of nature by collecting data from the natural world. Now, this is important because this is very different from the way the thinkers who followed Charles Darwin were understanding science, increasingly relying on probability theory to interpret hypotheses, to tolerate uncertainty, make arguments they couldn't necessarily test in a laboratory. Hodge and his colleagues refused to cordon off the world of faith and just say there can be two separate ways of knowing the world because their tradition of biblical interpretation understood inerrancy as deeply scientific. Now, I want to note something important. Hodge and his colleagues did not speak for all conservative Protestants. Historically, evangelicals have had many different ways of understanding the Bible's authority. The Wesleyan tradition instructed believers to understand Christ himself rather than scripture as God's most important revelation and to read the Bible with the aid of human reason, church tradition, and personal religious experience, the so-called Wesleyan quadrilateral. Anabaptists are a really interesting case. Historically, they have emphasized the task of the Christian community to collectively discern God's meaning. And they have viewed scripture more as a guide to daily living rather than a science textbook. However, think about the broader context of American society at the turn of the 20th century. You know, think about the cliches, right? Hemlines are rising, women are demanding the vote, millions of non-Protestant, even non-Christian immigrants are streaming into American cities. Some Protestants are altering their reading of the Bible to accommodate new science. It's no wonder that this defense of an errorless Bible that seemed to answer science on its own terms increasingly appealed to a wide array of conservatives in a lot of different evangelical traditions. Many of these conservatives adopted inerrancy as a battle cry, as a kind of symbol for the Bible's continuing authority in the modern age. Now I want to fast forward a couple of generations. During World War II and the early years of the Cold War, a new generation of evangelical thinkers, Billy Graham and the circle of evangelists and activists commonly called neo-evangelicals, picked up this task of bringing the Bible to bear on modern society. Graham and other young conservative Protestants like Carl Henry, who started out as a journalist in New York, Gordon's own Harold Ockengay, grew up in the wake of those battles between fundamentalists and modernists. The neo-evangelicals wanted to package inerrancy for the modern post-war age. They placed the idea of inerrancy at the center of something they called the Christian worldview or world and life view. Sometimes they used the German, Weltanschauung, Reformed theologians had picked up this word from German philosophy and developed a whole school of apologetics around it that they eventually called presuppositionalism. Presuppositionalism. I know that's kind of a mouthful, but the basic idea is, is very simple. The point of presuppositionalism is to pay attention to presuppositions, to the assumptions that undergird a person's worldview. The idea here is that no assumptions are neutral, and the human mind can only comprehend reality accurately if its founding assumption, the assumption you never question, is the inerrant truth of the Bible. Now really, this is a philosophically more elaborate version of Augustine and Anselm's old adage, credo ut intelligam, right? I believe in order to understand. Without grounding in biblical faith, reason will go astray. Neo-evangelicals took presuppositionalism to mean that if you are a true Christian, you cannot confine your religion to Sunday mornings. Your Christian assumptions, your worldview, have implications for every sphere of life, from education to economics. 
Now, I think you can see the political potential in that, as well as a political style, one very resistant to compromise or negotiation with non-Christian worldviews. These two claims, that the Bible is inerrant in a scientific sense, and that Christianity is not just a faith, but a certain kind of worldview that is totally incompatible with secular assumptions. In a certain way, these resonate with some of the basic ancient tenets of Christianity. But in this particular formation that I've just laid out for you, they come out of a fairly small corner of the Protestant world. Yet today, these reformed presuppositionalist ideas are almost everywhere. They have just saturated American evangelicalism. And every denominational archive I went to and every uh, uh, Christian college archive I visited, I went from reading documents from the 50s and 60s into the 70s and beyond, and I found more and more references to the Christian worldview and the popularity of these rationalistic ideas about inerrancy in these communities. Now, the question for me as a historian is why? Why did this happen? I think the neo-evangelicals did something new when they used inerrancy as not merely a bullet point on a list of doctrines, but as the cornerstone of a worldview. Now, remember, they began their efforts during World War II at a time when Europe was in the shadow of the Nazi Weltanschauung. And that, by the way, is why most Americans knew that word, Weltanschauung. It's an odd word, but they were reading it in newspaper coverage because journalists were picking it up in Hitler's speeches and recording it, writing about it. This is a time when all kinds of Western thinkers, liberal and conservative, religious and secular, were wringing their hands about the West's answer to that Weltanschauung, the West's crisis of ideology and identity. The end of the war hardly meant the end of this worldview problem. 1945 inaugurated a much longer war of ideology against communism. Marxism, Leninism, and Maoism, these were sophisticated world and life views. They were pseudo-religions with their own sacred texts, rituals, plans of salvation. So the neo-evangelicals provided an appealing ideological structure at just the right time in this age of ideology. They gave conservative Protestants a way to talk back to the secular world, not with a narrow list of doctrines, but with a broad approach that made sense in the context of their culture. I want to make one more big jump. This time, let's jump forward a few more decades and talk about the rise of the Christian right. Ordinarily, scholars make this a political narrative. They talk about backlash against the civil rights movement, the context of the Cold War. All of that's very important. Politics are, are crucial. But they do not tell the whole story. I'm pushing back against sociologists and political scientists who sometimes have suggested that religious beliefs are really just political beliefs or prejudices in disguise. It's the politics that we need to fold into a much longer intellectual and theological narrative, not the other way around. From the evangelical perspective, the 70s were not just a time of legalized abortion, gay activism, racy sex ed textbooks. This cultural upheaval climaxed at the same time as really uh, the height of a crisis over the authority of the Bible. Now, of course, evangelicals have been arguing about the authority of the Bible for centuries. But things exploded in kind of a new way in the 1970s. They were arguing about women's ordination, the right approach to missions, which translation of the Bible to use, which churches were, were practicing the right view of biblical authority, which weren't, all at the same time that mainstream American culture seemed to be drifting further and further from traditional Christian beliefs. Many leaders came forward with solutions to this crisis. A wave of gurus who largely operated outside of traditional church structures. The most famous guru of the 1970s was a Presbyterian ex-missionary named Francis Schaeffer. And 
I know many of you are familiar with him, if only because uh, you had a forum with two of his most well-known students here just a couple of weeks ago. I want to dwell on Schaefer's story a little bit because it shows us how the neo-evangelical theology came to have major political consequences. Schaefer grew out, up outside of Philadelphia, but he spent many years as a missionary in post-war Europe. You've probably heard of his famous commune in the Swiss Alps, Labrie, which is still going strong. I was there myself a few years ago. Schaefer taught evangelicals that saving America and saving Western civilization required defending biblical inerrancy and living the Christian worldview. For about 20 years, beginning in 1963, he toured the U.S. on a massive lecture tour, dazzling evangelical audiences with his very breezy account of Western civilization. And part of his appeal was definitely the persona he cultivated. He always wore his trademark Swiss hiking knickers and knee socks, at a time when most evangelical men were pretty clean cut, he wore his hair a little bit long and scraggly, he had a goatee. He usually began by accusing Thomas Aquinas, poor Thomas Aquinas, of suggesting, kind of accidentally, that the human intellect was free from original sin, thereby, Schaefer said, liberating human reason from the authority of the Bible. And according to Schaefer, it all went downhill from there. You know, Western civilization had just deteriorated until hitting rock bottom with Roe versus Wade. And along the way, Schaefer gave you these capsule biographies of Da Vinci, Kierkegaard, Sartre, Picasso, you know, really seductive, quick summaries of complicated ideas that made you feel you now mastered it. I mean, he really left his audience's heads spinning. The books based on these lectures sold millions. The documentaries that came out of it did very well as well. Schaefer wanted his followers to have an intellectual awakening, but he wanted that awakening to inspire political action. Roe versus Wade really radicalized him. At a time when there was really no national Protestant pro-life movement to speak of, Schaefer is one of the key guys who convinced evangelicals that this was their issue, that they had to get out and picket abortion clinics. Schaefer trained in the same circles as the neo-evangelicals, and he is really the one who taught evangelicals in the pews the language of presuppositions and the Christian worldview. I have found evidence of his influence in communities ranging from the Mennonites to the Moody Bible Institute. He's everywhere. But I have also found an array of evangelical leaders who were trying to figure out ways to refute Schaefer, push back against the neo-evangelicals, to present their own view of how Christians should address cultural change. Jim Wallace and his hippie friends at Sojourners were claiming the ethic of life on behalf of a much more progressive politics. The Mennonite theologian, John Howard Yoder, was busy writing his colleagues saying, guys, we need a Mennonite Francis Schaeffer. We need a Mennonite to get out there and talk about Anabaptist cultural theology. None appeared. Nazarene leaders were writing back and forth to each other saying, this is really not our tradition of understanding biblical authority. We see the Bible as potentially more compatible with evolution. We believe, because of our views of sanctification, that perhaps God wants the role of women to change over time. But no one could match Schaefer's charisma. He helped solidify the public imprint of evangelicalism to channel evangelical energy into one particular dimension of the ethic of life, opposition to abortion. He inspired much better known leaders of the Christian right, people like Tim LaHaye, Jerry Falwell, Pat Robertson, who have, were all very explicit in acknowledging Schaefer's influence. He took the theological foundation laid by those early fundamentalists and the neo-evangelicals and transformed it into a persuasive narrative of what had happened to American culture. When we look at the contests of ideas in history, we usually see that the winners are the ones who offered a story that helped people make sense of the chaos around them. And I think that's exactly what happened here. Now, this whole time, the secular mainstream media had a pretty monolithic view 
of evangelicalism. Journalists more or less accepted Jerry Falwell and Billy Graham as the spokespeople for all evangelicals. Recently, when these journalists have finally started to perceive some dissent in the ranks, they have been proclaiming it's the crack up of the Christian right. But I think evangelicals themselves and observers who paid closer attention understand that this subculture has always harbored plenty of internal disagreement. The so-called new trends that we are seeing today, uh, particularly among younger evangelicals who are disillusioned with the political activism of their parents' generation, uh, who are now rediscovering theologians like John Howard Yoder, who are folding the cause of human trafficking, for example, into that Christian ethic of life, or thinking differently about the role of women in the church, about sexuality. These currents have deep sources. They're not necessarily liberal or modernist, although certainly they come out of a kind of contention with modernity. They have roots in those dissenting strands of American evangelicalism, like the Anabaptist or Wesleyan Holiness churches. Today, it seems to me that conservative evangelicals are at a kind of crossroads as the number of self-identified Christians in America declines with every single poll they do. Mainstream culture and law are pulling further away from traditional Christian teachings on sexuality. And more and more evangelical leaders I talk to in my journalistic work are using the language of the Christian counterculture. They're saying now we are a moral minority. We are a prophetic minority. We have to embrace this. Though it is not at all clear that that language resonates with the Christian rank and file. And I think this is one of the things we're seeing play out in the current presidential election. I'd be interested in your thoughts on this. As evangelicals come to grips with their declining cultural authority, we may begin to see them really struggle with the legacy of leaders like Francis Schaeffer, with the implications of inerrancy and culture war as a small subset of reformed thinkers understood it. As you're learning in seminary, I'm sure, there is a lot more to the Christian story, to the evangelical story, in thinking about what is really one of the most ancient Christian tasks, how to be in the world, but not of it. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Molly. Um, gosh, there's too many um, nuggets in there uh, for us to um, tease out and, and ask you about, but we're going to try. Um, uh, this very simple story becomes very complex uh, the more you think about it, but it's not so complex that it can't be put together. Uh, so there are a couple of microphones uh, floating around, uh, and um, uh, jump on in as we say uh, quick, crisp questions, not sermons. This isn't homiletics class asking you to prepare the sermon, uh, and we've got uh, a, an enormously important resource here with us today, uh, and so um, uh, feel free to jump in into the conversation. I guess, let, let me start us off. Uh, the in the world but not of the world uh, um, clash, if you will, that's very much a part of the Christian tradition across the ages, uh, does have a peculiar modern cast, as you've kind of narrated, that uh, gets told in the story of the secular versus the religious. What's peculiarly modern about the secular that's not part of the ancient story? I mean, surely there were secular forces at work, but there's something peculiar about what secularity means in the modern world. And in part, as you think about Schaefer, so central to the lecture today, is there something interesting about the enemy, if you will, the other, the secular, in the post-war period that was particularly problematic to people like Schaefer or 
Dobson or others uh, in that era. Talk a little bit more about the other side for yes. a, a quick second. Yes, the words secularism, secularization, these are almost as messy and debated as the word evangelical <laughs> or evangelicalism. And it is a secularism is a Western phenomenon, and it, it originally anyway, and it emerges um, out of the uh, aftermath of the Reformation and the wars of religion, and a desire to uh, more formally separate the spheres of personal belief uh, and the conviction of uh, the religious convictions of political leaders. Uh, from political jurisdiction, from political authorities. It has earlier roots, but, but it's really a phenomenon, uh, as we understand the idea today, of the 17th century and an attempt to create a more peaceful Europe that would allow, within bounds, still within some bounds of orthodoxy, some kind of peaceful coexistence among people who no longer adhered, at least nominally, to the authority of the same church. Now, when uh, we use the term secularization today in our own context to try to put a label on some vague process of cultural change that seems to involve the declining authority of organized religion, there are a few connotations this, this term can call to mind. One is uh, declining statistics of church attendance, declining involvement in the institutions of organized religion. The second is the privatization of religion. Mm. And this is perhaps the most important meaning. Uh, the assumption that your religion is something you're free to practice in your home, in your place of worship, but it is not something that you should impose on people other than you and your family in law or in the public sphere in, in some way. It's a private matter. And this is, this is a particularly Western idea that comes out of really a Protestant understanding of what religion is. The Protestant assumption that true religion starts first with a change inside you, the individual, your own change of heart. And from that internal individual change follows everything else, follows collective worship, follows public ritual. Therefore, the most important thing to be safeguarded and in a sense separated out is private belief. We see this even in how the Supreme Court treats religion. Uh, the Supreme Court is very uh, wary of adjudicating what counts as real religion. But one thing they have been happy to rule on is the question of sincerity. As long as you are sincere, as long as it seems like you truly believe, you know, pastafarianism or whatever crazy belief you're claiming to believe, then you deserve the protections of the First Amendment. This way of looking at religion makes very little sense to many people outside the West or who live in the West but come from non-Western religious traditions uh, in which you cannot extricate the individual from communal practices. You cannot separate orthodoxy from orthopraxy. And then the final third uh, meaning of secularization is an actual decline in what people think about the supernatural. And that's much harder to measure. So we can measure the growing number of people who tell the Pew pollsters that they are nuns, right, N-O-N-E-S, that they're not uh, affiliated with any organized religion. But we cannot really see what's going inside, on inside their hearts. Some of them are atheists, but many are in that vague category, spiritual but not religious. Is this secularization? Is this a decline in faith in the supernatural? Probably but we're not quite sure. Now, I think uh, someone like Francis Schaeffer, when he talked about secular humanism as the enemy, he was talking about all of these things, but particularly he was concerned about the way in which the realities of multiculturalism and modern pluralism required greater privatization of religion, uh, required uh, Christian Americans to allow that their faith was no longer the foundation, you know, to the extent that it had ever been, of public law, public culture, uh, the, the rules about, uh, you know, sexuality and, and gender roles, among other things. And when he narrated the story of Western civilization, he very much liked to treat secular humanism as this uh, evil, uh, hubristic, modern uh, example of, you know, man's ancient tendency toward arrogance, toward self-love, often cleaning up his narration of 
you know, the reformers, people like Luther and Calvin, who were trained humanists mm -hmm. and cleaning up their relationship to the Renaissance, which he saw as very much one of the roots of, yeah. of this decline. Uh, so he was very much concerned with this, with this retreat of Christianity's cultural authority. Amen. Amen. Let me jump in. John. Uh, first of all, thank you so much. I've only begun reading your book and I've uh, already been wowed by it. Um, I, you mentioned earlier when you were talking about uh, the Princeton School of Thought regarding inerrancy and Charles Hodge in particular, and then you uh, came into the modern era with the presuppositional, kind of the Vantillian approach to how we deal with the worldview issues. One of the things that I've noticed with, with Hodge and, and the Princeton School is that they tend to operate maybe unknowingly at times from a kind of a Scottish uh, realist common sense, you know, you know, it's plain on the page, therefore I can understand it without any real, you know, nece necessity for, you know, scholarly work with the presuppositionalist view which says that that simply cannot be. You know, nobody comes to the text from in kind of out there objective, you know, looking down, uh, looking uh, from, from above view. How do we tease out these two major yeah. uh, impact, these two major traditions on e American evangelicalism, uh, and yet they, philosophically at least, uh, seem to contradict each other? That's a great question. That cuts really to the heart mm -hmm. of, uh, I think, one of the key paradoxes of evangelical intellectual culture, because the short answer is that most American evangelicals, to some extent, are both uh, descendants of this Princeton uh, what you're calling the common sense realist tradition, as well as inheritors of this kind of soft presuppositionalist way of thinking about the world in which you can never uh, be a neutral observer. The basic idea of common sense realism, which is a creature of the Scottish Enlightenment uh, originating in the 18th century, is that God plants in our brains some innate tools, common sense, uh, with which to apprehend the world. And we can apprehend the world directly. We have direct access through our senses to the way things really are. So this is in contrast to someone like Immanuel Kant, who says that you can never, all you have are your perceptions. You can never really get to reality. The common sense realists were trying to uh, shore up some of the erosions of the Enlightenment skeptics and, and give us some confidence in our senses. And they paved the way for a lot of natural theology, a lot of uh, efforts to demonstrate the truth of the Bible and God's authority, the claims of scripture, by appealing to evidence in the natural world and, and also by approaching the Bible itself as a body of, of scientific evidence. And there is a, a real difference between this view and the argument of these presuppositionalist theologians who would say natural theology can be a quite dangerous distraction. You can never prove, you can never get down to the very bottom uh, in your argument with an atheist and prove to him based on natural evidence and empirical investigation the truth of who Jesus is. You have to just accept that you're starting with a faith-based assumption. Now, if you look at the, uh, the institutional history here, uh, when the moderates effectively took over Princeton Seminary in 1929 and a bunch of conservatives decided to leave and found Westminster Theological Seminary not far away, uh, J someone like J. Gresham Machen was really a leader in that effort. And he's someone we associate with that empirical tradition. But he brought along with him Cornelius Van Til, the founder, for all intents and purposes, of this presuppositionalist school of thought because he saw real value in Van Til's project because, I think, he saw a certain way in which the two ways of thinking could inform each other. And when I uh, read modern evangelical apologetics, when I talk to evangelicals, I see a, a, a determined effort to hang on to both of these ways of arguing the truth of scripture. On the one hand, um, an embrace of this idea that you can't question the very grounding of the Christian worldview and that inerrancy has got to be something that you just start with. You cannot prove. And yet a desire all the same to prove it. A desire to be good empiricists, to be children of the Enlightenment, to make an argument based on the parameters of, of secular science. And it, it's a paradox. It's a tension in evangelical intellectual life. Uh, so you've hit on something, I think, that is a persistent theme in 20th and 21st century 
evangelical thought. Dr. Werther, I'm going to connect this perhaps back to Dr. Lintz's question <coughs> in relationship to secularization. I, w I wonder if you could comment on um, the group that's sort of known as radical orthodoxy and the relationship between that and evangelicalism as it stands today, so that the kind of response to the post-secular mm. world, the the James K. S. Smith, Alistair McIntyre, those sorts of characters, and then how that might be itself a, a new way of moving evangelicalism forward, even though that's a kind of nebulous and fairly broad range of people who fit that camp. Right, right. That's a great question. I think you're you're absolutely correct that thinkers like Jamie Smith and Alistair McIntyre, uh, and and the the reason why they've gained such such a following among among evangelicals is. Uh, is because they see a, a kind of um, intellectual poverty in the tools that conservative Protestants have been using to grapple with modernity up to this point. And they see, too, I think, an opportunity in post-modernity, an opportunity in this uh, instability of truth claims felt by all intellectuals, uh, in, including those, those in the secular, you know, mainstream academic world. Uh, and Jamie Smith particularly has been uh, very vocal on this point that postmodernity is not a problem for Christians if they see it as a, a, a chance to overturn the hegemony of uh, these secular liberal inheritors of Enlightenment empiricism and say, if, if there is no such thing as truth, if all perspectives are relative ones, then we deserve a place at the table as well. Um, he's also, in, in more recent years pushed back a bit against this uh, worldview language and said that evangelicals, Christians need to pay more attention to desire, not so much to the cerebral land of rationalism, but rather to the emotions and sentiments that motivate human beings. McIntyre uh, essentially rejects the foundation of um, modern rationalist thought in rejecting the distinction between facts and values. So he's, he's using some of those ideas of presuppositionalism, although he comes from a much broader you know, Catholic tradition, um, to say that all facts have to be rooted in some value-based perspective. He sees Aristotle and a kind of modern interpretation of natural law um, as a guide forward for Christians, in that Aristotle argued that all humans uh, are created with certain ends, you know, with, with a, a telos. And so a Christian can defend, uh, say, you know, heterosexual marriage or uh, criticize the legality of homosexual practices in the public square without appealing to proof texts by making an argument from natural law, uh, from the divine uh, natural, they would say natural if they're talking to a secular reporter or a politician, um, design of humans and their bodies and what they're made for and, and the relationships mapped out by this natural design. And this is, this is an acknowledgment that, uh, that you cannot um, prove your way to Jesus, essentially, and, and that in some, in some way, um, Someone like Cornelius Van Til was was correct and anticipated postmodernity mm. long before you know the the great thinkers were you know reading Foucault in their in their living rooms <laughs> and and doing this in in the 1970s and popularizing the instability of truth. Uh, so conservative Christians were were ahead of the game in that way, and this is I think a mistake that uh, secular observers often make to always talk about uh, conservative Christians as playing catch-up, as responding well after the fact to major cultural changes. In many ways, they are, they are right there responding you know, before their colleagues in, in liberal, uh, more secular circles to the same shifts in epistemology and authority in the modern era. Um, lots more. Whoa. Um, I'm a child of the late 80s, early 90s evangelical subculture, and um, I, I think one thing that um, I notice as a paradox, and maybe you can speak to historically, is sort of this desire to be the persecuted church, because there's honor in that, 
but, but at the same time, a desire to coerce and to press Judeo-Christian values um, on the broader society. Can you speak to maybe some of the historical trends that may c- have contributed to that and what you see in that? This tension between being, being persecuted and yet uh, having some sort of mm. mandate to, to transform the culture through coercion. Yeah, I think that, that tension is, a, is an old one, and it's not, it's not brand new in our own era. Uh, the historian George Marsden, in his great book uh, that he published in the early 80s called Fundamentalism in American Culture, identifies this as, as a key element of American fundamentalist identity more than 100 years ago. The tension between themselves as a holy and persecuted remnant and yet keepers of the flame who are really the only true Americans. And in some regards, that tension is in, inherent in the origins of Christianity as both a, a persecuted community that is called to reject the standards of the world and yet a community that's also called to transform the world and evangelize, right? So this is not a tension that modern you know, Western Christians have, have ma- manufactured out of the ether. But it also, in the American context, comes out of a long history of the kind of entanglement of Christian identity with uh, ideas about what it means to be American and who has legitimate authority in American society. And while we typically think uh, of our uh, country as one founded as this unprecedented experiment in religious toleration and pluralism, the truth is that while America was not founded as a Christian nation in the sense that someone like David Barton suggests it it was, in fact, most of the founders had in mind a a basically a, a country in which Protestants would continue to enjoy cultural authority. And that's certainly, that was certainly the assumption of, of most, most American colonists as well. So it was something they could take for granted because they were the majority, unlike Protestants in Canada, which for this reason has had a very different history of negotiating the authority of organized religion, the relationship between church and state. So it's only actually quite recently that American uh, Protestants have had to face up to the fact that they are, they are not actually in charge of the country, that multiculturalism has real consequences for their schools and their neighborhoods and their uh, political leadership. And so I think that is something that, that um, that's a particular historical development that they're struggling with in a new way since roughly 1970. I, I detect too, you know, a real sense among evangelicals that they want to honor the, the true physical sacrifice and suffering experienced by Christians in other parts of the world, the Middle East, uh, the Far East, um, it, where persecution really makes you know, American evangelicals' claims to be persecuted seem absurd, while, while, not, um, while not rolling over in the face of you know, sweeping changes to the way religious liberty is considered or uh, the, the involvement of, this, of the federal government in, in our lives in new ways, particularly in healthcare, that, that do uh, force a certain acknowledgement of, of compromise in personal belief and the realities of, of public institutions. Um, so, so there are historical, I think, and, and theological reasons for why that tension has taken the shape that you detect today. Uh, let me just tease that out a little bit more against the backdrop. Uh, uh, we've got quite a few uh, Chinese students, and uh, several as part of a conference uh, a year or two ago, listening to some Chinese intellectuals, Buddhist, uh, humanist, liberals, and evangelicals, whether it's 50 million or 100 million uh, Christians in China, it's still a pretty small minority. Um, th- they don't argue about whether China ought to be a Christian nation. Uh, that That's absurd in part, they have a different sense, but they had a sense of protecting um, the national identity of China from the West, whatever that might mean, Christianity being a Western religion. Uh, The West, often thought of as North America, has also a a sense of protecting a national identity. And and, uh, as as you kind of narrate the story, evangelicals think that's an evangelical identity. Is there something peculiar to American culture other than its history, or maybe it is just its history, that it has been predominantly a Protestant uh, country? Is it just the demographics that lead us into that argument? 
So the question of American exceptionalism. Right. Yes. Uh, American exceptionalism <laughs> is, uh, is, a, is a problematic phrase, but I think one that, that can be helpful if we think about it in the right way. Uh, it is the case that American rates of piety, in any way you might measure this, church attendance being the most obvious one, have really for the whole time that, that demographers have been measuring such things outpaced uh, their peer countries in, in Western Europe by a quite significant margin, specifically, particularly beginning in the 19th century and beyond. Uh, there were times earlier in our history when, when this was not a very churched country at all. You know, around the time of the revolution, something like only 10% of Americans were members of, of a church, and that, that greatly increased um, in the revivals of the early 19th century. And the question is, mm. why, why is this? And there are structural and cultural and demographic reasons. So the predominance of particular forms of Protestantism in this country, particularly the strength of the Reformed tradition, which is stronger in the United States than it is in any other country culturally, uh, has to do with the makeup of the first European colonists who came here, who, uh, among whom that tradition, the kind of dissenter free church tradition of uh, the British Isles was uh, disproportionately represented, also some parts of the continent. So that, that founding piece of our history is, is important. Uh, also, the, the way in which political authority was, at least at the federal level, decoupled from institutionalized religion seems to have encouraged the, the growth and the competition of uh, evangelical Protestant churches. Uh, churches that were rewarded by baptizing more and more members than their competitors if they adapted to the challenges of the American landscape. The huge geographic distances that separated new settlers, um, that made uh, you know, demands of you know, formal church attendance and you know, seminary attendance for people who wanted to become new ministers, totally impracticable, right? I mean, the, the Anglican Church never managed to get a bishop over here uh, before the revolution, and that was, you know, that was a major problem for, for that church's health. Whereas the Baptists and the Methodists got very good at sort of, you want to be an exhorter, you are an exhorter, go ride that circuit, right? You don't need a church, you can meet in homes. You don't need a fancy education to be a Christian. You don't need to be literate. I mean, this is a major reason why um, you know, the, the, the slave population became uh, so um, uh, quickly evangelized you know, in, the, in the time of the Second Great Awakening. This and the fact that the evangelical missionaries dropped their inconvenient opposition to slavery mm. and got you know, one access onto the, onto the plantations. But this openness, uh, the evangelical faith, to uh, a, a you know, relatively uneducated, mobile uh, culture uh, it helps explain some of the success of, of, of this church. And of course, in our own modern time, the international context of the Cold War and, uh, and, this, and the story of American identity and the merging of religious rhetoric with political rhetoric as uh, not just church leaders, but political leaders at the highest level sought to meld and galvanize uh, American citizens into, into a, you know, a phalanx of Christian defenders, Judeo-Christian, but really Christian for, for many, many Americans, uh, defenders of democracy, leaders of the free world against the godless Soviets. I mean, this is a major piece of recent history which helps explain why for so many native-born American Christians, uh, the sense of, 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 of Christianity is totally inextricable from one's sense of identity as Americans. I will say, though, as a footnote to this question of America's exceptionalism from the broader patterns of the West, that I think that exceptionalism has a time limit. And since uh, about 1970, our rates of church attendance have been going down. And while you know, some of the communities uh, in this country, particularly the Catholics, have been insulated from that decline a little bit by new immigration, that trend is not, not really bumping the numbers. There's no reason, unless you believe in you know, the supernatural spirit of revival, to see those numbers going up anytime soon. I think it will take a long time, but I think in a couple of centuries, our rates of church attendance in this country will probably be approaching those of Western Europe. Dennis. And then Bert. Yeah. <laughs> we'll give it back to you, Bert, next. <laughs> uh, this is somewhat a follow-up question to your last comment, and I know historians look to the past, not to the future, but could you comment a little bit more on where you think religion in America is headed, say by 2050, 
And then particularly, what do you see happening in evangelicalism over the next few decades? Uh, yes, historians always get uncomfortable when you ask us to predict, but you know, what's the point in some level of learning this history if you can't, can't say something about the future? Well, I don't think that uh, traditional evangelical churches are going to be, you know, extinguished or even reduced to hovering, uh, huddle, huddling sects in the way that some of the theorists of secularization in the 60s uh, thought would happen uh, anytime soon. Um, I, I do think that what many thoughtful evangelicals uh, have already noted is the case, that the center of gravity in global Christianity is, has already departed from the northern west to what we broadly describe as the global south, the non-west. And I think that broad pattern and the great health and flourishing of many Christian communities outside North America uh, gives, gives a lot of comfort to those uh, Christians who are perhaps disheartened by their declining membership numbers in this country. I mean, even, even the real juggernauts of the 20th century that always seem to be the exception to that pattern of decline, particularly the Southern Baptist Convention, um, have over the past few years seen declining membership numbers. Even the Assemblies of God, I think, is just about holding steady. They're not growing in the way they once were. And other great evangelistic churches like the Mormons, you know, the Mormons are, there's a very active back door in the Mormon church that they don't like to acknowledge, but it seems to me that they too are, are basically just holding steady in North America. Their real growth is, is international. Uh, so I think the, the, the big picture is that, is not one of, of the decline of Christianity, but merely the shift in the, in the center of gravity. But I think culturally in the United States, Conservative Christians are having to adapt to some of the public uh, institutional realities that Christians have long since adapted to in Western Europe and, and Canada. I mean, I think the Canadian model and uh, the, the compromises that, that Canadian evangelicals have had to face is probably the one of most immediate use for American evangelicals. Uh, the Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau declared multiculturalism a, a national ideology of Canada in, I think, 1970. And what he meant by that was that it would be an ideology funded by the federal government, that Canadians would be given resources to um, celebrate their identities as any kind of hyphenated person you might imagine. Uh, and of course, Canada has, has followed more closely the Western European model of a, of a federal government and provincial government that plays a bigger role in your life, that gets to, um, gets to decide uh, the shape of your, of your health care in a way that has uh, had very good outcomes for the health of Canadians. And Canadians are generally, including the Christians, very happy with the role that, quote, big government plays in their lives, with the way in which uh, government intervention has addressed major problems that should be real problems for Christians, like social inequality, like our new gilded age. Um, at the same time, I do think they have adopted uh, a more privatized view of religion. Uh, Canadians, and this includes Canadian evangelicals by and large, are baffled and put off by the the way religion is uh, so, it, the way it so saturates political rhetoric in this country, by the way it's this kind of a required, uh, you know, element of any any presidential speech, um, and they are uh, largely more comfortable with with religion being a more private matter, while um, also contesting their right to always uh, celebrating it in the in the public square, but not in a way that um, interferes with you know, their, their neighbors' views on abortion or gay marriage. Canada has no law on abortion, none. I mean, since, since the Canadian Supreme Court struck down the ban on abortion, there's been nothing that took its place in any way, which is, which is a, kind of an exceptional thing in the Western world. Most Western European countries have some rules about, about abortion, but it's, it's a telling feature of Canadian society that you don't, you, know, you, you don't talk about that, uh, that no politician will raise that issue in a really a serious way. Even the recent conservative prime minister would not give in to his more conservative uh, caucus members and do so. Uh, but I, I think that as our demographics begin to, begin to become more and more multicultural and, Canadian, and Christians lose more cultural authority, that north of the border may be, may be the future. Bert. So 
as you've mentioned, you know, Christianity is global today and evangelicalism is global and very dynamic in many parts of the world. Uh, but kind of ironically, evangelicals of color in this country is sort of a, almost an oxymoron in some ways. And so could you sort of speak to the very whiteness, even in your presentation, it was very much about white American evangelicalism. And is there such a thing as a, a black evangelical in this country or Hispanic evangelical? I think functionally evangelical is very much a white word. In my work as a journalist, I've done some interviewing among conservative black Protestants, and those few who have called themselves evangelical make a very deliberate decision to do so, because in some cases they want to opt in to certain culture war debates. They want to signal certain things. But they have, by and large, been the exception. And while many, many black Protestants in this country and uh, uh, Protestants of, of other non-white colors are theologically pretty closely in line on the you know, creedal essentials of Christianity with white evangelicals, historically their priorities have been different and their encounter with power has been different. Mm. And so you know, black Protestants have been much more worried about uh, matters of social justice, about you know, protecting their, their communities from white supremacy than they have about you know, debating evolution or the end times. Although if you polled them, generally, no one's done this in a, in a really a scientific way that I've seen, but the little, the little anecdotal pieces of evidence suggest that they generally oppose evolution. They generally don't have the same strength of feeling on end times matters that evangelicals at least once had. That issue seems to be fading from millennial evangelicals attention to. Um, but you know, there's been some attention to what's been happening to new Latino immigrants, uh, a decent proportion of whom leave the, their, the Catholic churches of their families to, to join Protestants. And so there's been some hopeful um, rhetoric among leaders of the Christian right that they are the future of the Christian right, that they are naturally family values voters who will support the agenda of defending traditional gender roles, uh, stopping the legalization of abortion. I'm not sure that the, the data uh, that we have so far, imperfect as it is, bears that out, precisely because Latino Protestants' encounters with power are very different. And they, they are far away from the uh, self-identified evangelical Trump supporter on matters like immigration. Most of them, not all. Some of them see themselves as the deserving immigrants and want to want to close the door. You do see that pattern. Um, and certainly their encounter with uh, social services and their attitudes toward expanding the social safety net are, are very different. They have a much more jaded view of the opportunities in, free, in the so-called free market than, uh, than white, white evangelicals generally do. So th those are very real divisions that are not strictly theological, perhaps, in the most uh, literal sense, but do have to do with theological priorities, do have to do with uh, your theology of culture and your ideas about the ethic of life and, and what it includes and where you ought to put your, your energy. Uh, so, you know, there have been, I think, fruitful theological conversations going on for decades between conservative white Protestants and uh, Protestants in the Global South, and this was particularly true at the, the Great Lausanne Conference in 1974, which spun off a continuing series of conferences that is still going on to this day, in which, you know, Billy Graham and, and John Stott were very ready to sit down and learn from Christians with very different perspectives on Western colonialism and, and the Western economy. But, you know, there, there is not, there, there's a, perhaps a cultural gap between some of the evangelical leaders and the trends we can trace there and the views of the grassroots, the rank and file, whatever you want to say, where there persists a very real strain of xenophobia, uh, nativism, racism, whichever word you prefer, that I think is a real barrier toward truly interracial collaboration. Um, one, one more along those lines, since you mentioned John Stott, uh, David Brooks writes this interesting article that if you want to understand evangelicals, that, that the media does not, although I'm not sure the media doesn't understand, but anyway, his point was, you need to understand John Stott. Uh, are we deluding ourselves that Stott, rather than Schaefer, uh, is the 
I'm cautious here, the true uh, inheritor. Uh, stop very concerned with social issues, but very uh, tempered in his uh, understanding of culture. Maybe because he's from the UK, uh, very committed uh, uh, to the global uh, church. Um, uh, uh, just a, uh, uh, a counterweight to some of the celebrities that you mentioned. Um, and, and is there hope for some of us that think Stott represents our tradition more than somebody like Schaefer? I, I think David Brooks in many of his columns is trying to call conservatives to be the best version of themselves. It's kind of wishful thinking. And that's part of what's going on, I think. Uh, you've seen this in his obsession with Trump. Trump. He can't believe the Trump phenomenon and every other column he writes is about, how can you people support this man? And it's a real, it's very uh, sobering about really the, the very tiny cultural authority of a New York Times columnist that doesn't make any difference what David Brooks, think, David Brooks thinks. Um, I, th I think that uh, Stott is someone who's op had to operate in a, in a different cultural climate in the UK, one that perhaps does anticipate some of the challenges that are coming down the line for, um, for American Christians and who also was more internationally minded and simply irenic in his personal, in his interpersonal relations, uh, is an appealing model to evangelicals who are not willing to compromise on orthodoxy, but want some mentor, some model for how to how to be orthodox, and yet be to use a, a word that evangelicals love, winsome. <laughs> such a such a giveaway. If you use the word winsome, I know you are an evangelical. I know you are a particular kind of evangelical. And it's meant to signal, that word is meant to signal that I am not a foaming at the mouth white supremacist. I am not Jerry Falwell. I am not those bumpkins that H.L. Mencken wrote about when he wrote mm. about the so Scopes trial. I am sophisticated. I am interested in having a, an intellectual conversation with you. But this brings us back to the question of authority and who actually has authority in, among American evangelicals. Uh, two uh, Christian scholars named Randall Stevens and Kyle, Carl Guyberson wrote a really interesting book a few years ago called The Anointed. And it contrasts the work and the hopes of some of the great evangelical intellectuals like Mark Knoll, Francis Collins, who are greatly respected by their secular peers, right, against the work of charlatans like <laughs> Ken Ham of the Answers in Genesis Creationist Ministry or David Barton, whom all historians of any credibility think is just a danger to the Enlightenment <laughs> and, and truth. Um, and, and these authors contrast their relative esteem among experts with their following you know, among the grassroots. And the reality is that the so-called charlatans are the ones who enjoy far more authority. You know, their podcasts have far more listeners, their uh, websites attract far more hits than those uh, evangelical intellectuals who are really trying to, to, yeah. to break new ground in a kind of working relationship with, with uh, the secular academic world. So, you know, John Stott, John Stott is an interesting, you know, he does have more popular appeal than, right. than sometimes is realized, but but he's not, not someone who has a mass following. Amen. A couple of more questions. You, 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 you okay? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Let's keep going. Uh, here in the front. Thanks so much for coming. Uh, this is very interesting. Um, you had mentioned um, briefly about the, uh, the uh, relationship between purpose and fact. And I was wondering if you could answer two questions. Um, what was it that made you interested in this particular mm -hmm. subject? And uh, the other, um, where do you see your research going? To, to what effect do you, uh, mm -hmm. what, what effect would you like your research to have? What purpose do you have in doing this? Mm -hmm. uh, well, thank you for for the, the opportunity to indulge in a bit of biographical reflection. <laughs> um, I uh, went to graduate school because I wanted to become a religion writer, not particularly because I wanted to be an academic. While I was at graduate school, the bottom fell out from the journalistic 
profession, even compared to academe, which is also <laughs> no great shakes. So I decided that I would have to do the journalism on the side. But my point is that my aim was to train myself to write with some, something to contribute uh, about the contemporary religious scene in America. And while I had interests all over the place, you know, ranging from medieval history to, to, to Russian orthodoxy, I decided I wanted to focus on American evangelical history. I had to do all that homework in the earlier centuries, as you, as you have to do if you want to understand modern times, um, but with a particular attention to work that I could, I could dovetail with a journalism work uh, that would not just involve work in the archives, but actually talking to living, breathing representatives of these traditions. And as I got into it, I, I became fascinated by some of the dynamics within this subculture that um, many outsiders see as very monolithic. And I noticed that a number of historians had really emphasized the history of the reform tradition uh, and, I, and how they told the story of American Protestantism. And I went into the archives wanting to correct that, wanting to push back against that. What I found instead was that, in fact, the reform tradition has had this disproportionate influence and all these other traditions I was studying, so I had to revise my, my thesis. I saw it in the end to try to tell a kind of intellectual backstory of the culture wars and the Christian right that uh, supplemented this view of the culture wars that, that, is, uh, that seems to revolve around the Cold War and the Civil Rights Movement because it, to me as an intellectual historian, you have, to go, you have to go further back. Going forward, I'm interested in continuing my study of evangelicalism but integrating it into, uh, I guess, a broader analysis of uh, cultural and, and, and political uh, thought in, in America I'm uh, interested in a, in a project that explores kind of challengers to democracy and the expansion of democracy since Puritan times. And that will feature plenty of Christians, but it will also feature all kinds of other characters. I've been very gratified by uh, the reception this book uh, has, has received uh, in the evangelical community, including uh, from evangelicals who I expected to be mercilessly critical. Um, Al Mohler, the president of uh, Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, a great uh, you know, icon of very conservative, reformed uh, Southern Baptist uh, you know, leadership, um, reviewed the book on one of the blogs he's associated with, and he was extremely gracious. Mm -hmm. He thought I was too critical of Carl Henry and Francis Schaeffer, <laughs> of course, but he said every evangelical should read this book. I was especially surprised because I had written a rather critical profile of him in Christianity Today a couple years earlier. So I thought, he's gonna, this is his chance to get back at me. But it's a real testament to his winsomeness, I suppose, <laughs> that he did, not, he did not take that opportunity to, to go after me. So it's, it's received a really um, patient and self-reflective reading among Christians in a way that is an incredible testament to evangelical intellectual life, I think. And it's a kind of um, uh, self-reflection that one doesn't often see among secular liberals, I think. Mm. I mean, I think, I think the, the flip side of my critique of the Christian worldview talk is that I've noticed that in our uh, common intellectual life, conservatives tend to be much more thoughtful about their presuppositions and about you know, how exactly they are reasoning through their arguments and how it all fits together than liberals do. Liberals have a kind of allergy to ideology. It's, it has to do with uh, the way in which far left ideologies became so anathema in this, in this culture. And uh, a tendency among uh, those on the left to emphasize the, prag the pragmatic or pragmatist strain of their heritage. But it, it has its own anti-intellectualism mm. uh, that is a real syndrome. And in a way, liberals could learn from this conservative evangelical attention to presuppositions, even if it can sometimes be superficial in, among Christian circles too. Uh, maybe that's a, a good place to end. I'm looking at the clock and realizing classes start at, at two, so there's a, a time. But we appreciate how winsome you have been about our winsomeness <laughs> in reflecting on this uh, sometimes not so winsome tradition uh, uh, of ours. Um, uh, uh, not affirming that theology is simply biography, it, it is, it's an important uh, narrative for us to understand as somebody outside of our tradition understands it. Uh, and so we do uh, want to express our appreciation for the, um, 
the ironic spirit uh, with which you've entered the conversation and helped us e enter it. Uh, in some sense, evangelicals have told their story, um, but few outsiders have told that story as well as you have. So we really do appreciate it. So